If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of, well, let's just say John chapter number 3. John chapter number 3. Um, we finished a, a series we were in probably about eight weeks called The Gospel is Good News. Started a new series today uh, on the church. And uh, I call it God's Amazing Church. We need to talk about all the things that God is doing in the church. And uh, God only speaks through his nature. God is who he is. That is his nature. Everything that he does flows from that nature. God is perfect. God is kind. God is loving. God is good. Um, and uh, we are just uh, very grateful for that. So the church was created to reflect God's nature. It is an extension, literally, of who God is. Everything that we as a church do needs to be a reflection on our Heavenly Father, our amazing Savior, and our wonderful, loving, guiding, shepherding Spirit. It is His will that we seek to do. We were bought with a price. We are not our own. We freely came and yielded our everything unto him. And that's what everything is about. It is about a life given to him, in love with him, serving him. I want to share a, a verse. I think it's an amazing verse. It comes out of Deuteronomy, chapter number 7, verse 9. This is what the verse says. Know therefore that the Lord, your God, your Lord, your God, is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's a powerful verse. It's overlooked. When we get to the book of Deuteronomy, we're running through it, and we're just uh, chasing off on finding something else. But every now and again, when you're in there, and when you find this particular verse, the verses before it are not... They don't really uh, set your heart ablaze. It talks about the correction, the things that God does. And in the next verse, it talks about what happens if we do not follow God in his love and his gracious gift. But in the middle of that is sandwiched this wonderful verse. Let's look at it again. Know therefore, by the way, as Christians, we know it with an experiential knowing. We just don't know it in fact. We get to experience it in our every day. Know therefore, that the Lord, your God, is God. He is faithful. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenants of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. No matter what, when we woke up today, we knew God was there. We knew God was looking, God was watching, and we know that God was loving. John 3, verse 16. Y'all know that verse? Stand with me. Let's quote that verse together. You say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now remain standing, then let me read to you two more verses. That was John 3.16. But 1 John 3.16 says this, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's how we know. It is the greatest gift of love. It's the greatest understanding of love and explanation of love that you'll ever understand in all the world, that he gave his life for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 says this, God is love. And he who abides in a love abides in God and God in him. Let's pray. Father, we know those of us who have uh, come to know you in a personal way, who have accepted you into our life, have given our life to you, given our sins to you, received your forgiveness, received your salvation, received your blessing of being with us, being one, being our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our Keeper, our Sovereign God. Lord, we are grateful. 
We are grateful. We are grateful. We are grateful that your ways are the same to a thousand generations and that you're faithful to all. Lord, you've never let one person down, not one at all at any time. And Lord, we are your church, your bride, your representation, the recipient of your love. Father, help us to see, help us to know, help us to walk with you so that we can fully experience. May your will be done in our lives. May your will be done in the church. May the church stand triumphant. May we uh, find the end of ourselves so we can walk in newness of life with you. We are grateful. We are blessed. You are God. There is no other. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. Story is told of a, a man who was a bridge keeper. That meant that he kept the bridge over the river. Now, the, the, over this particular bridge was to take trains over the river. And yet, because the waters were deep, there were a lot of uh, large ships that would come through. So it was built so that this, this bridge keeper could take, and through just shifting of a, a few levers and the gears would begin working, the bridge would be taken out of the way so that the large ships could come through. That was his job, to close the bridge so that the trains could come through, to open the bridge so that the ships could come through. And either way, they were to signal the bridge keeper so that he would know who was coming and so that he could have everything prepared for them when it came. But on one occasion, and it only takes one occasion like this to really get your attention, the person that was driving the train did not signal ahead. And by the time the bridge keeper knew that the, the train was coming, he had a decision. It looked like it was going to be a, a very close call. He would have to move the, the bridge real quickly because it was set up for a boat, but it had not, he had not set it up for the train. If he could, he could barely make it, but then he looked. And he saw that his young child was playing amongst the gears that would move the bridge from one to the other. And in a matter of seconds, he had to make a choice. It was to choose all the people whose lives were on the train or choose the life of his only son. God knew the agony of such a situation. He had a choice that had to be made. And yet, this is what is so amazing. Before the foundation of the world, before he ever spoke it into life, before he ever gave us this gift and this chance to live a life, before all of that, the sovereign God made the decision that it would be worth it because he is a God of love, to give us the opportunity of life, the opportunity to know him, though even then he knew it would cost him, cost him unbearably. There is none, no one, not one of us, though we may think from time to time that we understand, there's not one of us that knows the pain that came upon the Father when Jesus was faithful to the cross of Calvary and became our sin. And because he became our sin and God, who is a God who cannot accept sin and loves us, he allowed Jesus to die for our sins. But that mean, means when he became sin, there was a separation for the first time in all of eternity from the Father and the Son. What wondrous love is this. It's hard for us to fathom the love of God. Perfect love withholds nothing. Yet sin is real and denies us what love wants to give. That's the problem. God is on one side with all the love of the world. We're on the other side. 
and we need a bridge to make it to where we can cross over. And for us to be able to cross over, it meant the life of the Son of God so that we could cross over and be with Him. God gave us so many examples of His love. The greatest example is Jesus, but there are other examples as well. Are you listening to me? The church is to be an example of God's love. It is the representation of who God is and what God seeks to do in the world. And when people see the church, they should see the love of God. When they see us as we are, we should be representing, loving, giving. We should be serving, not for our own sake, There is a higher calling as we yield ourselves unto the one who has yielded all for us. That is the church. Lost people act like lost people. Lost people don't know the difference. But somebody has got to shine the light of love. And God chose us. God also gave another example of love. Mothers. Mothers are an amazing thing, aren't they? I'm grateful for my dad. I'm grateful for dads all over. I'm grateful for dads that are the head of the home and lead the home and set the direction and and care for the home and provide for the home. But it, it it would be kind of a different attitude in the home if we just had dads. I've always heard and I've always said dads may be the head of the home, but mothers are the heart of the home. My dad wasn't very touchy. Uh, One day we were in church and uh, my dad was my parishioner. (laughs) Payback, right? And uh, I was doing what I always do. I was going around shaking hands and got to the next pew and dad was there and reached out and shook, shook his hand. He looked at me and said, I guess that's kind of how we do it. I said, what do you mean? He said, we just kind of shake hands. My dad wasn't the kind of, to, to hug you. I was 40 years old before my dad ever told me he loved me. But my mom did. Can't ever remember time. Mom wasn't there loving one of the things I love about my mom was, uh, sorry, can't talk about your mom without coming from your heart. Sitting in church by mom, dad up there preaching, and I better be behaving. Amen. Mom said I was the heaviest leaner she ever had. I would sit by her and just lean on her. And, and uh, I grew up, I was born in 62. I grew up in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, and women would have those I don't know what they were made out of, satin, but everything was soft. And I just loved cuddling up to mom and just love, just rubbing on her because it just felt so good. She said I was the heaviest leaner and just wouldn't, just aggravated her to death in church. But I praise God for my mom. Mom was 38 when I was born. Dad was 41. Mom, dad left mom pregnant when he went to World War II. That's kind of what you did back then. You didn't know if you were going to come back, so you would just, uh, your wife you would be pregnant. That way his name could carry on. And my oldest brother was named after my father. He was Ronnie Alton. Everybody will watch Jack carry him out. Y'all not listening to me at all. <laughs> if I got you back. All right. So uh, then they decided that they would wait to have uh, another child when they could afford one. Then they decided if they were going to have any more children, they might as well have them because they could never afford them. So my brother was born almost 10 years later. They had two boys. He was named Wade Franklin, after middle name, after uh, my mom's side of the family. My oldest brother was Ronnie Alton, the middle name, after uh, my dad. Then four years later, they had this beautiful little girl. And she was beautiful, and she is brilliant, and she was a daddy's little girl. And uh, he never told me he loved me, but boy, he told her. 
He never hugged me, but he hugged her. Amen? And I just stood back and watched, I guess. I don't know. But they had their family. Spread out, but they had their family. And then four years later, um, can I say I was unexpected? Mama didn't like it when I said I was an accident, but I mean, it is what it is. Can we just say that? <laughs> right? <clears throat> and they had anguish. They didn't want me. I mean, let's just be honest about it. They, they had another child, and they like, they had a son that graduated high school, and mom's pregnant. What you going to do? What you going to do? And the first few months of her pregnancy was kind of tough on her. Somewhere around the fourth or fifth month, they kind of decided, we're going to have a child. We better make the best of it. You know, in our world today, a lot has been talking this week about the woman's right to choose. Do they have a legal right? By the way, what if, if the Supreme Court comes down and overturns Roe v. Wade, that doesn't change abortion. That just knocks it back to the states. In my opinion, it might make things worse. You say, how in the world? It'll make things better in a certain way, but I'm here to tell you, when you wake up those ungodly people who do not care and do not love, only they love themselves, they're going to come at this thing hard. It's just going to make it a national issue. They can, uh, they can elect, any, they, in, in their state, they can make up whatever rule that they want to. The, the Supreme Court's just saying, there's nothing in the Constitution that gives you that. So you make up your own laws and we'll obey the laws. It's the right thing to do. And yet, I am so grateful that when an unexpected child came up, that nuisance of a kid that talked all the time, that they gave me a chance, that they let me have life, that I could hear of God, know of God, love God, serve God, give my life unto God. And yet, today, it's become a political issue. Every woman has that choice with her pregnancy today. I'm just grateful my mom chose love. She was tired when I was growing up. My dad was too. He was off busy doing his thing. My dad was a brilliant man as well and very successful in everything that he had ever done. And He was doing all those things, but yet they still provided me took care of me loved me the family is a wonderful place of love I will never forget I think if I go old and get senile there's a lot of things I'll forget I may even forget who I am but I don't think I'll ever forget the time walking down the hallway towards my bedroom my parents bedroom was just about further down the hallway on the other side of the hall my mom on her knees praying for me. And I heard her, went and cracked the door. Praise God for a mother's love. Praise God for unconditional love. Praise God that, that, that he, he can come and, and, and give somebody that will raise us and nurture us and cherish us, and teach us, and correct us, and, and encourage us, and be so tender. Praise God for a mother's love. But with God, there are no unwanted children. God is not willing that any should perish, but all to come to repentance. Hell has to be expanded. Every time someone dies that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, because he was not created for them, but for the devil and his angels. And the church is God's family, all rolled into one. Henry Blackaby wrote a book called The Ways of God. And in that book, he um, told a story 
about a young man who went to war, to the, went to the Korean War. And while he was there, he was wounded. And they uh, sent word to his parents that his, their child was wounded, but that he would survive. And after he got healthy enough, he was in a hospital in Japan, he began to call home to talk to his parents. Eventually, they shipped him to a hospital on the East Coast, and he would continue to call home. And then there came a point in time that he called and said, um, I'm coming home. Wonderful, son. So grateful. Can't wait to see you. Come on home. But then he said, I met someone in the hospital, and I would like to bring them home with me. Well, son, if he's a friend of you, yours, he's, he's a friend of ours. You just bring him home. Well, the, one, the thing is, is that my friend, um, he, he jumped on a grenade. And in the process of it, it blew off his legs, and he's in a wheelchair now. Son, that's so sad, but that's fine. You, it, it'll be okay. You, you bring your hero friend home. Yeah, but Dad, he, he doesn't not just has a no legs and in a wheelchair. He, he he's lost an arm and he's lost an eye and he's been badly disfigured. Well, son. I don't know that that's a good idea. You come on home, but leave your friend there in the hospital. They'll, they'll know better how to take care of him. It, it'll, it'll make it awfully hard on us. But Dad, he's, he's my friend. Just come along, home alone, son. Your friend would never fit in here in his condition. Well, that night they were notified that their son had taken his life. And when the body arrived for burial, they noticed that the body had no legs. No arm. And disfigured. All he wanted to know was that he would be received home with love. That's all he wanted to know. Unconditionally accepted. That is the definition of God's love. We're in a world we make mistakes. Sometimes things just happen. And what this world wants to know is that God loves them. And you accept them. So he gave us as the church. And the church, it's our joy to take people just the way that they are. Aren't you grateful for grace that meets you where you are at your point of need? Not if you're good enough. Not if you're beautiful enough, smart enough. God just loves you. It's His nature for a thousand generations. All grace is given to us. And we are to give it like we have received it. The church must, listen to me, the church must be the most welcoming place on all the earth. We should be the most like heaven, this side of glory. It doesn't matter what they are. When I was a child, it didn't matter what the world was saying. 
They taught us a little song. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. When I was 10 years old, I understood that Jesus loved me and accepted me. We should be the closest to heaven this side of glory. A pure representation of Christ. In our actions, in our demeanor, our deportment, in our love, we should be the most pure representation of the loving, giving, forgiving, overwhelming Christ. There's a song that we sing. Caleb's going to put the words up to the song. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to the blood. Oh, see, in your mind's eye right now, move from a pew here at New Holland. With your mind's eye, go straight to glory and see the one who is seated there for you. See his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Oh, what a question. Dear, dare such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown. Is there one more verse? I believe there may be. We're the whole realm of nature mine. That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. That is the command for me. That is the command for us Christians. That is the command for the body of Christ, the family of Christ. We are given the opportunity to be reflectors and examples of the greatest love.